All right, we'll be in Jeremiah chapter 23 tonight. Jeremiah chapter 23. We won't have too many more weeks of this particular series as we go through the names of God as they're presented in the Old Testament. But tonight we find the Hebrew people and what may be a familiar situation. And you, you may say, never been where they've been, but maybe you can understand where they are a little closer than you realize. If you, if you have children, if you've ever dealt with children, have you ever uh, been faced with the situation where a child asks you for something and you said no? And then unbeknownst to you, they went and they asked the other parent or a grandparent, and they said, yes. Now, they didn't know. We'll give them the benefit of the doubt. They didn't know you said no to begin with, okay? But that's kind of what we find the Hebrew people doing. I mean, don't you get upset when a kid does that to you? Didn't you get upset when your kid did that to you? He said, I told them no, but they did it anyway. Well, that's kind of the way God feels with the Hebrew people as we find them here in Jeremiah chapter 23. But on a much greater scale, God established rules that they were to live by. But the Hebrew people said, well, we don't like those rules, right? So God, we're going to find, we're going to find somebody whose rules are a little more amenable to the way we want to live. So they've turned to some foreign gods. They're doing some other things they're not supposed to be doing. They're finding some way to justify this lifestyle. And they're already, because of everything that's going on, they've been split into two kingdoms already. The northern kingdom, which retains the name Israel, is already in Assyrian captivity by the time we get to Jeremiah chapter 23. And the southern kingdom, Judah, to whom Jeremiah is prophesying, they're not too far from going into captivity themselves. Babylon's knocking on the door. Unfortunately, it's already too late. But God has a message for them despite that, despite the fact they, they refuse to live according to his rules. As we study this text tonight, we'll see that through the name that God reveals, their society as they know it is utterly doomed. But for those who believe, there's hope. And that hope is found in the name that's revealed here in Jeremiah chapter 23. Begin reading in verse 1. He says, woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, God of Israel, against the shepherds who feed my people, you have scattered my flock driven them away, and not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for the evil of your doings, says the Lord. But I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries where I have driven them, and bring them back to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, nor shall they be lacking, says the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that they shall no longer say, as the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives who brought up and led the descendants of the house of Israel from the north country and from all countries where I had driven them and they shall dwell in their own land. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the lessons we learn from the history that's presented in the Bible. 
Thank you for the way you reveal yourself. May we see tonight how you reveal yourself in this text, not only to that original audience of Judah, but you reveal yourself to us as the Lord, our righteousness. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord, our righteousness. In the Hebrew, that's Jehovah Sidkenu. Jehovah Sidkenu. Now, some people have told me they're taking notes. They're writing this down. You'll never spell it right the first time, okay? I'm going to spell it for you real quick if you're writing it down, if you're listening on the live stream. It's got, you'll never spell it right because it starts with a silent T. You know, why do they do that? I don't, it, why, the, the T's useless, but it's there. So it is capital T-S-I-D-K-E-N-U. T-S-I-D-K-E-N-U. Sidkenu. Jehovah Sidkenu. We know Jehovah. That's the intimate name of God to the Hebrew people, the God who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that most intimate, most familiar name to them. But what is Sidkenu? What is righteousness? Now, if you were paying attention this morning, it's amazing how God works all this out. Uh, Brother Eric mentioned righteousness and a definition for righteousness this morning in his sermon. But at the most basic form, the most basic definition of the term righteousness is simply to say it's God's standard. That's what righteousness is. It is God's standard. God says to the people of Israel, I am your standard. I'm your standard for living. You want to know what your life is supposed to look like, God says, look right here because I have revealed it to you. But they didn't do that. That's not where they were looking for their standard of living. So what were the results? Let's look at that real quick before we get to what is the really good news. We find at the beginning of chapter 23 that because they did not heed the standard of God, they were a people scattered. And they're about to get a little more scattered. You look there in the beginning of of chapter 23, and we find an indictment against the leadership. I mean, all the people are guilty. All the people have failed to live up to the standards of God, all of them as a whole. But this is an indictment against the leadership because they ought to have been leading them in the right direction. As we look here, woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. This is talking about the leadership from the king down to the priest. This is not just talking about the, the priest, the, as we would say, the, the, you know, the pastor. A lot of times we think about the shepherd being the pastor. This is from the king down. Because in Israel and in Judah, they're supposed to, although they didn't always, the king's supposed to be a religious person. It's supposed to be a spiritual leader just as much as the priest is. Although they had different roles. But he said, hey, you're the ones who are at fault here. You should have been leading the people right. God gave them a chance time after time to repent. Look at this most recent incident in in chapter 22. Turn back a page or so to Jeremiah chapter 22. Let's read what God says to them just before this, this final condemnation came down in chapter 23. In Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 1, thus says the Lord, Go down to the house of the king of Judah, and there speak this word, and say, Hear the word of the Lord, O king of Judah, you who sit on the throne of David, you and your servants and your people who enter these gates. Thus says the Lord, execute judgment and righteousness, and deliver the plundered out of the hand of the oppressor. Do not wrong. Do no wrong and do no violence to the stranger, the fatherless, or the widow, nor shed innocent blood in this place. For if you indeed do this thing, then shall enter the gates of this house, riding on horses and in chariots, accompanied by servants and people, kings who sit on the throne of David. But if you will not hear these words, I swear by myself, says the Lord, that this house shall become a desolation. For thus says the Lord to the house of the king of Judah, 
You are Gilead to me, the head of Lebanon, yet I surely will make you a wilderness, cities which are not inhabited. I will prepare destroyers against you, everyone with his weapons. They shall cut down your choice cedars and cast them into the fires. Listen to this verse. It's going to come up again in a little while. And many nations will pass by this city, and everyone will say to his neighbor, Why has the Lord done so to this great city? Then they will answer, Because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord their God and worshiped other gods and served them. God gave them a chance to repent. He told the king, he said, you enforce righteousness. You enforce the standards of God, and none of this will happen. But if you don't, here's what's going to happen. And he told him, he said, this place is going to become a desolation. People are going to come by this city, and they're going to say, what happened? It's completely destroyed. Why would God do this to his people? Why would God allow his people to become a people scattered, to become a people taken into captivity? Hasn't he made them a promise? Yes. Aren't they his special people? Yes. And that's why the standard's higher. The standard is higher for the people of God than for the people of the world. As we've studied the names of God, we found a few of, a few of the names we've studied, we found out some things that it would apply to this situation. We found out that he's Jehovah Jireh, the provider. Yet, his people are about to become captive and completely lack provision. He's Jehovah Nisi. He's supposed to be their banner in victory. But they're about to become completely destroyed. He says he's Jehovah Shalom. The Lord, our peace. But they're about to become completely torn apart and completely lack peace. And you say, isn't God contradicting himself? No. Not at all, because here's the problem. Before he can be Jehovah Jireh, before he can be Jehovah Nisi, before he can be Jehovah Shalom or any of the others, he's got to be Jehovah Sidkenu. He expects his people to uphold his standard. If his people are to experience his provision, his victory, or his peace, or anything else, he expects his people to agree to his standard. Now, did you hear what I said? To agree with his standard. We can't uphold them, but we ought to agree with them. More on that in just a minute. We have a people scattered. But as we move on and we get over to verse 3, we find that not only are they a people scattered, they're a people who still have a promise. Look what he says again in verse 3. He says, But I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries where I have driven them and bring them back to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them in contrast to the ones who haven't been doing so, they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, nor shall they be lacking, says the Lord. In the midst of the cultural chaos of the day, God wants them to know, ultimately, he's still in control. And ultimately, he's still Jehovah Sidkenu. He's still the one who sets the standard. No matter what society says, no matter what their society said, no matter what other Hebrew people were saying about what was right, what was wrong, what wasn't right, what wasn't wrong, God said, you don't get to decide that. I get to decide that. He said, I'm Jehovah Sidkenu. I am the Lord, our righteousness. You know, society's got a lot of different ways to decide how things work. Decide what's right and what's wrong. Our favorite American way is majority rules, right? Let's vote on it. Majority rules. Should we do this? Should we not do that? Majority rules. 
That's our favorite way to do it, but it's not scriptural when it comes to morality issues. Some people say, well, each person ought to decide. I've touched on that in an earlier sermon in this series. You know, you find your truth, whatever that means, and uh, you just go with whatever seems right with you. Well, that's what, if you read the book of Judges, they tried that, it didn't work, right? It says each one did as was right in his own eyes. Didn't work out for them. God sets the only standard that matters. So how will Israel return to that standard? God says they're going to. It says it right there in verses 3 and 4 and and 5 and 6 that I forgot to just read again just then. But God says Israel's going to return to those standards. Maybe more importantly for you and I, because you say, what does that matter to me sitting here in a pew at Brister Baptist Church in 2021? Here's the more important question. How do we attain that standard? They couldn't do it. Tried and failed. Thing is, we can't either. But God's, God gives the solution. If you look again in verse 3, he says, I will gather the remnant. If you look down a little further, he says, I will bring them back to their folds. You look in verse 4, he says, I will set up shepherds over them. You look in verse 5, he says, I will raise David, raise to David a branch of righteousness. God never said, here's the roadmap for how you attain my standard. God said, I'm coming to get you and I'm going to bring you to my standard. That's what he did. They couldn't meet his standard. We can't meet his standard. So God did it for us. And of course, we know we have the full revelation of God here in the text that they didn't have then. We know that branch of righteousness is Jesus Christ. Paul knew that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Paul says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He had told the Corinthians in the previous letter, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, by, do, by his doing, by God's doing, you're in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God. And what else? And righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Wasn't because of anything Jeremy Langley did. I can promise you that. What ain't because of anything you did is because of what Jesus Christ did. That we're able to stand before God righteous because of the blood of Jesus. I like what Dr. Tony Evans said. He said, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're going to heaven on credit. You know, lots of folks don't believe in credit. That's fine. Dave Ramsey says, debt is dumb. Cash is king, right? Right, Miranda? We're going to heaven on credit. If you're going, there's no other way to go there. That's the only way to get to heaven is on credit. It's only by the righteousness of Christ that we get there. The righteousness of God gets us into heaven, and that's wonderful. And you say, hey, I'm saved. I know I'm going to heaven. I know it's by the righteousness of God. What does it have to do with me here and now? We're not done. Jesus In Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, in the middle of the Beatitudes, it's the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now Jesus says, Blessed are those who in this life, who in the here and now, who as they go about their life, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for God's standard of living. They'll be filled. So you say, well, that's, that's wonderful. The result of hungering and thirsting for seeking God's standard of living is to be blessed and to be filled. What does it mean to be blessed? Well, at the most basic definition, it means to be happy. I like being happy. Do you all like being happy? I like being happy. But I said, there's got to be more to it than that. So I pulled up the Amplified Bible and I read the Beatitudes in the Amplified Bible. 
And of course, every beatitude starts with blessed. Blessed, we like to say in the King James Version. And uh, it is, I looked it up. I said, what does that mean? Here's what it means. Refreshed. Inwardly peaceful. You like to feel inwardly peaceful? I do. Joyful. I love this one. Nourished by God's goodness. Content. Morally courageous and spiritually alive. You ever feel dead on the inside? You ever feel like you're just not spiritually alive? You need some moral courage to stand up and do what's right? Jesus said hunger and thirst for righteousness. Hunger and thirst for God's standard of living. Sounds to me like there's a lot of really good reasons to hunger and thirst for Jehovah Sid Canoe while we're on earth. But the thing is, the fact of the matter is, too many times we end up satisfying that craving with something else. It's kind of like the boy I know, true story, who accidentally ate two donuts for his mid-morning snack not long ago. And so he wasn't that hungry at lunch. That's what happens when you fill up on junk food. You don't want the stuff that's truly nourishing. And here's the thing. We oftentimes, and I know this because it's true of me. I'm sure it's true of you. I know it's true of the world as a whole because I look at Facebook. And it's true if it's on Facebook. But we consume the attitudes and the opinions of the world. And too many times we fill up on those. You know the person that's too hooked on cable news that that's all they can talk about? And they're so worried about the events of the day and they're worried about what's happening in Washington and they ought to be worried about what's happening in their own house. And you know those types of people? They just get so filled up on the attitudes of the day and the opinions of the day. And Jesus says, don't be hungry for that stuff. He says, be hungry for my standard of living. When you fill up on the other junk, you won't worry about living life the way God has called you to do it. Be careful not to consume the attitudes and the opinions of the world. It reminds me of the children's song we used to sing when I was growing up. I guess they still sing it. And said, oh, be careful, little feet, where you go, you know. Oh, be careful, little mouth, what you say. What were the other lines, though? Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Yeah. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. Why? Because the Father up above is looking down with love. So maybe be careful of what we consume so that we stay hungry for Jehovah Sid Canoe, one last thing and we're done. Verse 7 and 8. God said, here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to bring you back to, I'm going to bring you home. I'm going to bring you back to your land. I'm going to put, I'm going to put shepherds over you who are going to feed you. I'm going to do all these things. But look at verse 7. He says, therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord that they shall no longer say, as the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of Egypt. But as the Lord lives, this is what they're going to say instead, as the Lord lives who brought up and led the descendants out of the house of Israel from the north country and from all the countries where I had driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. God says through Jeremiah, something so big and so wonderful is going to happen, it's going to make you forget about when your ancestors walked through the Red Sea. That's how they recognize God. This is Jehovah. This is the one who brought us up out of Egypt. This is the one who took us through the Red Sea. That's how they remembered him. That's, and God says, no, I'm going to do something bigger and better than that. He says, one day I'm bringing you back to your land. If you know the history, you know what, you know, they came back, you know. You read uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, you read those books, and you read about how they 
they came, they built the temple in Ezra, they built the wall in Nehemiah, and people were coming back from captivity, and all that's happening, and all was well and good, but what happened? A.D. 70 rolls around a while later, and poof, gone again. Until 1948, wasn't it? When the political state of Israel was reformed. You see, these returns to statehood are not what God had in mind when he's talking through Jeremiah. Because the return that Jeremiah's talking about doesn't come about until the righteous branches come forth. And we said, that's Jesus Christ. Now, I had to do a lot of reading on this because, honestly, this was outside of my scope of understanding. And so I had to see what people who were a lot smarter than me had to say about all this. And here's what I figured out that what Jeremiah is talking about may very well be what John's talking about in Revelation chapter 21. In Revelation chapter 21, John says this, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, Hey, you remember that city that got utterly destroyed by the Babylonians when they came in to take them captive? Hey, John said, I saw a new one, a new version, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. They shall be his people. God himself will be, will be with them and be their God. What John see? He saw a new Jerusalem. He saw a brand new version of that city that had been utterly destroyed when the Babylonians came in. According to the scholars that I read, said, you know what? Jeremiah's prophecy hadn't come true yet. In 2021, it's yet to take Place, and I'm excited about that because it sounds pretty excited and I look forward to being there myself. The day's coming when God's going to make Jerusalem brand new and our world's pretty messed up right now, don't you think? But God said he's going to make it all brand new. And if Jesus Christ is our Savior, we get to experience it too. Did you catch what verse 3 said? In, in uh, Revelation chapter 21, it said he's going to dwell with his people. What did he promise? What did Jeremiah say God promised? That he was going to bring them back from everywhere they'd been scattered. Now, if God's dwelling with all of them in one place, it kind of sounds like they've all been brought back, right? He's going to dwell with them. They'll be his people. God will be with them and be their God. If Jesus Christ is your Savior, you get to be there too. Why? You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. But he's Jehovah Sid Canoe. He's the Lord, our righteousness. He and he alone makes us worthy through Jesus Christ to stand in the presence of God. Is there anything before we close?